Okay, so um, to put it really briefly to you, um, the novel, as you know, uh, the title really, The Stranger uh, or The Outsider, because it was translated in maybe, maybe two or three different ways, but really the, uh, the title really tells us a lot about the exact meanings of the, of the novel. It is, yes, um, the man, uh, Merson, really he's a strange man in his own way, really. His, his attitude to life, his behavior, his um, ways of looking at things in every sense, sometimes me, you know, is, is quite strange. Quite strange to understand for us as, for example, normal people. We say, how can you do that? Why do you do that? In what sense are you doing like, like that? And so on. So from that perspective, you can say that this is a weird text, really strange text, yes, in terms of application of what we said, the absurd, really, literature or absurd um, mentality, because this is an example of the, really, uh, of the absurd, because you try to understand uh, why this man is, for example, uh, behaving this way. And we, we have at the beginning, you know, of course, the novel, we begin with the idea of his relationship to his mother. You know, the way he talks about his mother and the attitudes that he takes towards her, of course, especially, you know, the dramatic shock that we get, for example, you know, um, it, we don't see his mother, for example, before, um, before, you know, as you can see, the novel began with her death and the ways in which he, you know, went to attend her funeral and the feelings and what he did exactly the next day after her death. Um, okay, so really in, in every sense, um, in every sense, um, all the details about even his daily life, his daily business that he goes through all the time after her death, after he went back to his work, after he what, what he was doing and behaving with his girlfriend or his intended uh, uh, woman, and his attitude towards marriage and attitude towards love and what he thinks about love and what he thinks about marriage and so on. Now, really all of these, you know, um, are absolutely dramatic examples of what say, come on, man, what's wrong with you? Why are you doing this? And how are you behaving like this? And so on. So that's what I mean here when you say, I'm saying the stranger, you know, he is a stranger in his, you know, personality and attitude and the ways in which he looks at life in general. Of course, uh, I'm not talking here. The main question really is, is when he killed that b boy, that man, that, um, uh, you know, this Algerian Arab man, as he called him, uh, who is the brother or, of you know, his friend's girlfriend, you know, which is really crazy. You don't kill someone on behalf of your friend, you know, and for no real reason, if you like. So the idea, again, is say, what kind of killing is this? You know, so the, the, the really, the problem is here, as I said, the, the amazing way of trying to see why you did that, you know, sometimes you can't really have the full answer. And that's the meaning of, absurdism really that's the meaning of absurdism you need to say something you know this is absurd something that you really can't understand completely you say come on why did that and why didn't you do this and, and and so on so you see this is what i'm saying here really at the beginning um of today because it, that's that's the main message and even at the end you know when he was of course, sentenced to death by the courts because he was found guilty of killing this man. You know, again, the, the trial and the process of his trial, you know, again was a funny proof and a funny, really dramatic proof how he also looked at the whole question of death. 
He knew that he was going to be hanged. He knew he was going to be killed and punished by death because he killed someone. Again, his attitude, his total attitude towards being punished to death or by death is again a funny thing, an absurd thing. And you can't understand how somebody would look like, you know, would behave when he's no, when he knows, for example, he pre well, he says that he's innocent and he didn't really mean to kill him or whatever. But the evidence produced against him, for example, again, the evidence was really amazing and funny. And can be say, well, this is not strong evidence. I mean, one of the examples of evidence, they said that he did not really care about his mother when she died. How can you commit someone or sentence someone to death because they did not cry on their, on their mother's, for example, death or at the time when his mother, his mother died? I mean, this is not really an evidence. This is not really a clear, if you like, proof that somebody is a criminal. If you can't cry to somebody, if you can't cry to your parents' death, it doesn't mean that you are a criminal, you know? I think this is the idea. And he said, you know, this, this novel is about a man, is about a man who was sentenced to death because he couldn't cry. He couldn't cry, uh, you know, um, on the occasion of his mother's death. And he said, come on, is that true? I mean, I think Camille, Camille said that in one of his interviews, and I will show you this maybe later. And you say again, you know, all these things, in a sense, I'm saying, lead to one conclusion, which I said, the stranger, it's a strange thing, you know, is impossible to understand and so on. Are you getting what I'm saying here, boys and girls? Hajar? Yes, Hello? doctor. You you following? Yeah, I'm following. Yeah. Um, I mean, I will I will show you, as I said, um, more and more. I'll try to show you as many examples from the text as possible, really to prove this. And this novel, as I said, is a huge really a huge influence on modern literature and modern, many modern writers in English or in French or even in German, because Albert Camus was such a great figure in absurdism or in the absurd literature, which is really the main thing when you say the meaninglessness and the samelessness or the nothingness and the emptiness and the futility and you know all these crazy things which you really say come on what what is this and what do you mean by this and you know whenever you always when you ask always these things you know you ask questions about trying to really pinpoint to exactly pinpoint things really in the, in the absurd literature you can never pinpoint something for sure there is no certainty about things like as i said uh, samuel beckett in his great play waiting for godot you know the whole play was about you know these two men waiting for godot to arrive and godot really never arrives and the whole play as i say waiting for godot and we start to ask who is this godot you know could be could be any one of us or could be any, if you like, could be spiritual, I mean, spirituality or physicality or whatever. So here the question is in the way of the presentation of the whole matter of trying to understand. And really the meaning of this is the meaninglessness. What? Come on, doctor, what do you mean? I'm saying the meaning of all this is it's meaningless. Hmm? It's meaninglessness is the meaning. Nothingness, if you like, is the something of these texts. The whole idea, the emptiness of things is the meaning. Um, 
Well, you say, yeah, because sometimes you say, um, I, I don't understand this and I don't get this and I don't understand this and so on. So the, really I say, well, the writer wants you to feel this, you know, and it's, it's not really easy to make you feel this, that you read and read and read and try to see, come on, what, what's that, you know? So really, this is, uh, this is really the idea I'm saying here, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my, my dear students today, um, you know, this is really the, the question here, okay, about, about um, the absurd in general. Now, I'll go to back to the text, for example. Remember, as I said, this is lovely. I think it's a lovely novel. I really think it's a great novel in many ways. I mean, there are stuff in it, there are things in it which you may not like, I know. And this is, of course, literature. And in literature, you find ugly things and good things. And because this is life, you know, in a way, in a way, because life is that. Because we don't have, you know, all things are great uh, in life or clean or pure or lovely or whatever. You know, life is full of complicated, crazy things. Now, um, notice here when, when um, he is reflecting on his mother's, you know, loneliness and being, being uh, in the home, because he was telling us here about, you know, how she was there in the home. And the man, the warden, if you like, this man, the warden who was looking after the home, he's telling him about, he's trying to give him excuses of not coming to see his mother. And now look at him again. As I said, he's the narrator character, always commenting and saying things. <clears throat> Notice here again, this is his funny attitude. That was so. When we lived together, mother was always watching me, but we hardly ever talked. During her first few weeks at the home, she used to cry a good deal, but that was only because she hadn't settled down. After a month or two, she had, she would have cried if she had been told to leave the home, because this too would have been a wrench. That was why during the last year, I seldom went to see her. <laughs> you know, so he's, he's saying, well, you know, I didn't go because she was fine about it, and there's nothing wrong with her life in the home. Um, and, and we, to be honest, he said, we never talked, you know, and I think this is funny and this is strange when, when he's saying again, she was always watching me, you know, um, again, yeah, this idea uh, of, of being watched again is, um, is strange. Um, why would she watch him, you know? Um, and all this idea, I think, again, is it's 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 really his own interpretation. This is his own interpretation and readings of things. Maybe we believe him. Maybe we we don't uh, about what he's saying here. Also, it would have been it would have meant losing my Sunday, <laughs> not to mention the trouble of going to the bus getting my ticket and spending two hours in the journey each way. What a wicked man to say this, isn't it? To waste my Sunday, losing my Sunday, you know? As if to say, you know, because his Sunday is, you know, it's his, his weekend. He said, I don't want to waste my weekend to go and see my mother. What? Are you a real man? Come on. Are you a real man? I don't think so. You know, again, look at his, his, his funny, he said, the trouble to go to the bus and to get the ticket and to spend two hours, you know. So he's a mean, miserly, stingy, absolutely stingy, wicked man to say this. You know, he, he doesn't have the time, he doesn't have the urge, he doesn't have the money and, and all this to, to go and visit his poor, really um, absolutely lonely mother. 
So, but he said, you know, that's me. What can I, you know? The warden, the warden went on talking, but I didn't pay much attention. You see, so I'm saying, you know, the whole novel is narrated by him. And he's reflecting his own feelings about what, what this whole thing really means to him. Um, and as I said, the warden here is the man, the, if you like, the man, the caretaker, the person who takes care of this house or, or looks after, you know, do, those people who live, uh, who stay in this house or this home for the elderly. Finally, he said, now I suppose you'd like to see your mother. I rose without replying and he led the way to the door. As we were going down the stairs, he explained, I've had the body moved to our little mortuary as so as not to upset the other old people, you understand. Every time there is a death here, they are in a nervous state for two or three days, which means, of course, extra work and worry for our staff. You can see, of course, the warden is a nice man, really, he's a real... Uh, sort of, uh, you know, caring man is saying, we move the body for you just to have a look because you want to maybe say goodbye to your to your mother. We don't want people to other, the other residents of the place to see this because they get nervous. And again, notice the attitude, really. We crossed the courtyard where there were a number of old men talking amongst themselves in little groups. They fell silent as we came up with them. Then behind our backs, the, chat the chattering began again. Their voices reminded me of um, parakeets in a cage, only the sound wasn't quite so shrill. <laughs> the warden stopped outside the entrance of a small, low building. So here I leave you, Monsieur, Monsieur Merson. If you want me for anything, you will find me in my office. We propose to have the funeral tomorrow morning. That will enable you to spend the night beside your mother's coffin. As nobody you, sorry, as no doubt you would wish to do. Just one more thing I gathered from your mother's friends that she wished to be buried with the rites of the church. I've made arrangements for this, but I thought I should let you know. So, as I said, you know, this man, the warden, is uh, talking to him, as I said, you know, as if, you know, this man really is interested or he cares about his mother's funeral, whether she's going to go to the church and they say prayers or whatever, or, you know, he doesn't really even, really he has not, he has no uh, whatsoever respect for any of this, but, you know, he's even absolutely careless about the whole matter. So, um, you know, um, of course, uh, look what he said, I thanked him, so far as I knew, my mother, though not a professional atheist, had never given a thought to religion in her life, <laughs> you know? So again, it shows the idea of, uh, again, I think this is important and maybe I, again, I would like to highlight this. He said, he's really surprised, he said, I know, you know, I know that my mother was not really religious. So how come she's asking to be met, buried through a church rites or to bear it according, as he said, the rites of the church, you know, sort of in a religious fashion. Now, again, you may say, well, well yeah. So because he's an atheist, you know, atheist, maybe a non-believer, is a terrible non-believer. Maybe that's why we don't understand his attitudes or he doesn't care about religion, or he doesn't care about anything. Maybe if you say, oh, well, oh, wow, oh, maybe, maybe, because he's such an atheist whose behavior 
is absolutely miserable and amazing and shocking to all of us who want really all of us who want meanings to understand through uh, whatever we see in life and i think that's natural that's really be you know absolutely normal and natural because we live we live on meanings we want meanings we like meanings we want to know things and you know that's why we we try to understand this man's behavior all the time maybe that's one of the reasons that his behavior is weird could be because he's such a funny uh, amazing non-believer i don't know i really don't know i'm just wondering really i'm just wondering and asking maybe this question do you think this is one of the reasons or one of the explanations about his uh, atheistic or you know being an atheist or a non-believer i don't know i mean this is one of the funny things because at the end when he again this is a very important scene when the they brought him before he he was punished by hanging they normally the people who are punished by death normally they ask a religious man to come to say to ask the sentenced person to for you know to say his prayers or to say something if he wants something to you know as a final wish we say as we they say a final wish and normally they ask a religious person like a sheikh or a priest or a parson or whoever who would come and talk to him and say like a prayer thing or whatever and this here really this is a very dramatic absolutely dramatic situation when our friend Merceau, uh, the way he reacted against the priest who came to ask him to uh, you know ask forgiveness to admit and ask and and you know uh, beg for forgiveness and to be forgiven and to say a prayers at the end to say one at least um you know a moment of of maybe atonement maybe atonement to atone thanks and say forgive me i made a mistake forgive me i made a terrible mistake by killing this man please god i want you to forgive me you know so even that situation uh, absolutely was absolutely dramatic and amazing and he said so many crazy things which proves again here which proves his terrible terrible atheism he said though my mother did not profess did not admit that she's an atheist but she was an atheist he means she was an atheist so how come now she wants a religious uh, you know burial ceremony he is shocked you know well i, I don't know really this is this is an amazing thing about about our our friend and um you know i am reading this really slowly to to uh, to uh, let you feel what i'm saying here about the absurd uh, stuff i entered the mortuary you know where they keep the dead bodies like 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 in a big sort of um, refrigerator it was a bright spotless clean room with whitewashed walls and a big skylight the furniture consisted of some chairs and trestles two of the latter stood open in the center of the room and the coffin rested in them the lid was in place but the screws had been given only a few turns and their nickeled heads stuck out above the wood which was stained dark walnut an arab woman a nurse i suppose was sitting beside the beer she was wearing a blue smock and had a rather gaudy scarf wound round her hair sorry scarf wound. sorry this is a verb 
not not noun wound wound round her hair again notice remember as i said this novel was set in algiers in an arab country of course in and and albert camus was born in algiers uh, or in real life and and he reflects a lot about his own really background and realistic autobiographical relationship to algiers and to algeria as a whole and he was as i said he was not an arab uh, he was uh, you know a son of a colonial sort of um, you know frenchmen who were in algeria during the french occupation or colonization of algeria and the ways in which he of course he reflects on the arab question or arabs or muslims or whatever of course we know this is there is a lot of racial issue and you know and we should read it here freely from a decolonizing uh, perspective i think which is uh, really the case so the way he describes this woman as if she's sad the way she looks at his mother's you know uh, if you like um, body just then the keeper came behind me he's evidently been running as he was a little out of breath. We put the lid on, but I was told to unscrew it when you came so that he could see her. You know, he's telling him, you know, these people are dead bodies are put are put in coffins, of course, and the coffin will be locked, you know, completely, as you can see here, screwed. Um, and will be buried in the same way. And this is really funny in some countries. I think in many of Western countries, they put the body, the whole coffin in the ground, deep in the ground. I mean, we Muslims, uh, I think we in Syria, we don't do that. We, we don't put the coffin, uh, we put the body, uh, only the, the person dead, um, the dead, um, of course, body only. No, no coffin because, you know, the wood. Why would you put the wood, uh, you know, with the body uh, under the earth? I don't know. I mean, this is the idea here. He said, um, "I want. I thought you could want you. You could, you know, you could see her. You wanted to see her." While he was going up to the coffin, I told him not to, not to trouble. <laughs> He's saying, don't care, don't do that, I don't want to see her. Mm. While he was going up to the coffin, I told him not to trouble, meaning I don't want to just leave the screws, I'm not going to, you know, get the lid out and, and up and see her. Eh? Eh? What's that? You don't want to, you don't want me to? No, I said. He put back the screwdriver in his pocket and stared at me. I realized then that I shouldn't have said no. And it made me rather embarrassed. After eyeing me for some moments, he asked, why not? But you didn't sound reproachful. Sorry, sorry, let me read it again. You know, the man is shocked, he said, come on, you don't want to see your mother? You don't want to have a look, a final look at her body? Why? You know, the man is, you know, here, as I'm saying, the impossibility of understanding, you know, his behavior. Why not? But he didn't sound reproachful, he simply wanted to know. Well, really, I couldn't say, I answered. You know? So, maybe this is his, his most, uh, most of the time, I think, his, his, his explanations. Really, his explanations is not explanation. His interpretation of things is, again, ambiguous and not clear he began twiddling his white mustache then without looking at me said gently uh, 
Um, let me ask uh, my my friend, the man here, Imad Ayub. Ayub, are you here? Ayub. Ayub. Yes, doctor. How are you? I'm fine. Doing well. Yeah. Do you know? Do you have mustache? Do you? Do you have mustache? Do you remember, doctor, I have mustache or not? No. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> That's why I'm asking you. I know that you don't have it. Really? And do you know what? <laughs> yeah. Do you know what is twiddling? He said twiddle his mustache. Do you know what, what is that? The meaning Name of that? By his mustache, making a circle, what he means. Yeah, it's just like that, you know? Men uh, doing who, in, you know, doctor, in this uh, Syrian series. Exactly, very good. In Bab al Hara, they always mm. do it like this, you know. And sometimes when they have nothing to do, they will be, you know, doing like it like this, as if you know they are so proud of their mustaches, you know. As if they, this man, they have the long hair. Yeah, and this is what he said: twiddling, twiddle. And this is really a funny, funny verb here. Yeah. He began twiddling his white mustache, you know. And really, this is funny. And um, it's it's done by by people who, uh, I mean, maybe next time I should grow my mustaches to just to. And I'm sure you know. <laughs> here, I don't see many people uh, having mustaches here. But anyway, uh, the idea really is quite funny. He's he's shocked. Uh, by why by this man then as if to say mm, mm, how come why this man is behaving like this and you know he's he's unbelievably unable to understand this man and then he said mm, then without looking at me he said gently I understand but really he did not understand really really he did not understand notice Notice uh, Marceau explaining, he was a pleasant looking man with blue eyes and ruddy or ruddy cheeks. He grew, he drew up a chair for me near the coffin and seated himself just behind. The nurse got up and moved toward the door. As she was going by, the keeper whispered in my ear, it's a tumor she has poor thing you know um the idea really um, um as i said you know look at him how he's uh, narrating and the language he's using i think is 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 very interesting and very simple i think very very simple to understand and really lovely uh, um, clear language i looked at her more carefully and i noticed that she had a bandage around her head just below her eyes if i lay quite flat uh, uh, sorry it lay quite flat across the bridge of her nose and one saw hardly anything of her face except that strip of whiteness as soon as she had gone the keeper rose. Now I will leave you to yourself. I don't know whether I made some gesture, but instead of going, uh, going, he halted behind my chair. The sensation of someone posted at my back made me uncomfortable. The sun was setting low and the whole room was flooded with a pleasant mellow light. The, the, the hornets were buzzing overhead against the skylight. It was so sleepy, I could hardly keep my eyes open. Without looking round, I asked the keeper how long he'd been in, at the house. Five years, the answer came so pat that one, so pat that one could have thought he had been expecting, expecting my question. You know, it's not. It's really again. It's it's amazing though how 
how really he comments and he judges, you know, everything around him. That started me, sorry, started him off and he became quite chatty. If anyone had told him 10 years ago that he had end his eight days as doorkeeper at a home at um, Maringu, he'd never have believed it. He was 64, he said, and hailed from Paris. When he said that, I broke in, ah, you don't come from here. I remembered then, before taking me to the warden, he told me something about mother. He had said, he had said she had, um, she would have to be buried mighty quickly because of the uh, heat in these parts, especially down in the plain. As if to say, you know, he wants to say that the weather here is so terrible and so hot. And that's why maybe my mother said, please um, try to bury me quickly because I don't want people to suffer the heat. At Paris, they keep the body for three days, sometimes four. After that, he had mentioned that he would spend the best part of his life in Paris, but could never manage to forget it. Here, he had said, things have to go with a rush, like you have hardly time to get used to the idea that someone's dead before you are hauled off to the funeral. That's enough, his wife had, um, had put it. You didn't ought you didn't ought to say such things to the poor young gentleman. The old fellow had blushed and began to apologize. I told him it was quite all right. As a matter of fact, I found it rather interesting. What he had been telling me, I hadn't thought of that before. Now he went on to say uh, that he had entered or, or he had entered the house as any ordinary inmate. But he, sorry. Um, you can see really here the, um, uh, you know, he goes on and on and on the, in the narration. As you can see, really, um, it's very interesting to read all this in details, if you like. Um, but but the, the question really is, is very interesting about how the whole idea is um, uh, very um, interesting, really. Um, how he feels and the ways in which he wants to um, to judge, really, to judge the whole matter in in really a funny way. Um, really, the whole idea is, to me, I think, is 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 quite uh, amazing. As I said, he goes on and on, but maybe I will read. Uh, again, his um, his attitude towards um, 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 the way he wanted to, uh, for example, notice here, he suggested I should go to the refectory for dinner, but I wasn't hungry. Then he proposed bringing me a mug of coffee or, you know, again, notice somebody who is supposed to be waiting and... Um, maybe sitting in, if you like, um, in a sad moment um, um, to, of course, I mean, the whole idea for him is, uh, again, was against him to ask to drink um, coffee and to have a cigarette and to behave as if there's nothing strange. You know, the habit at that time or the way at that time, the, film, the whole thing seemed to be really uh, strange there. Notice, as I am very partial, 
as you see, for drinking coffee. But he said, I wanted one. I said, thanks. And a few minutes after he came back with a tray, I drank the coffee. And then I wanted a cigarette. But I wasn't sure if I should smoke under the circumstances in mother's presence. <laughs> I thought it over, really. It didn't seem to matter. So I offered the keeper a cigarette and we both smoked. After a while, he started talking again. You know, your mother's friends will be coming soon to keep vigil with you beside the body. We always have a vigil here. When anyone dies, I'd rather go and get some chairs and a pot of black coffee. You know, again and again, you know, you get really uh, surprised um, about that. Um, Again, look at his comment, um, at his commentary there. Um, the way he looks at the whole matter and people will come and... He really does not want anybody to come to him and, and to attend the... or to do the vigil with him because he thinks this is... really, this is not needed, if you like. Note it. The glare of the while the white walls was making my eyes smart. And I asked him if he couldn't turn off one of the lamps. Nothing doing, he said. They had arranged the lights like that. Either one had them all or none at all. And after that, I didn't pay much attention to him, much more attention to him. He went out, brought some chairs and set them out round the coffin. No one, he placed a coffee pot and it. 10 or dozen cups. Then he sat down facing me on the far side of mother. The nurse was at the other end of the room with her back to me. I couldn't see what she was doing, but by the way her arms moved, I guessed that she was knitting. I was feeling very comfortable. The coffee had warmed up me up and through the open door came scents of flowers and breaths of cool night air. I think I dozed off for a while. Yeah, I mean, really, I, as you can see, uh, I don't know, I, I, um, I really want to read all that, but I can't, I will leave it for you to, at least I will show you uh, to read at least the first three chapters. I, I will I will uh, tell you exactly where and what to read um, in full. But um, look, um, uh, you know, um, uh, you know the the exact details. Notice we all drank the coffee, which the keeper handed round. After all, I can't remember much. Somehow the night went by. I can recall only one moment. I had opened my eyes and I saw the old men sleeping hunched up on their chairs, with one exception, resting his chin on his hands clasped round his stick. He was sharing, he was staring hard at me as if he had been waiting for me to wake. Then I fell asleep again. I woke up after a bit because the ache in my legs had developed into a sort of cramp. Um, really, um, this, uh, as I said, again, um, you know, this is a long narrative here, really telling us how he doesn't care about the whole idea. He is here and he's not happy at all. And he's amazed even by these people who are just, you know, inmates, if you like, in the same house. So... But this man here, he said, staring at him. This man, he said, staring hard at me. You know, he is an old man who was really a very good friend to his mother. And here he came and he, if you like, um, um, if you like, really he um, um, cried for her a lot and a lot more than anybody else and 
he, of course, Merceau was shocked and amazed, you know, how come, why? There was a glimmer of dawn above the skylight a minute or two later, one of the old men woke up and coughed repeatedly. Again, you know, they, you know, he goes on to tell us uh, about, um, about the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, now they wanted to go to take the coffin to the church to, um, and then to bury her, of course. Um, um, again, he's really telling us how they walked under the heat, in this terrible heat. You know, if you like, uh, the idea uh, is very funny. Uh, the way, again, he reflected that he doesn't like this going. And um, if you like here, again, he tell he told him about this old man that he was his mother's friend notice here an old friend of your mother to come with us his name is thomas perez the warden smile it's rather touching little story in its way he and your mother had become friend almost inseparable the old man people the, sorry, the other old people used to tease uh, Perez about having a fiancé. When, when you are going to marry her, they asked, he would turn it to her with a laugh. It was a standing joke, in fact. So as you can guess, he feels very badly about your mother's death. I thought I couldn't decently refuse him permission to attend the funeral. But on our medical officer's advice, I forbade him to, to sit up beside the body uh, last night. Of course, uh, as, as I said, um, you know, uh, uh, just a minute ago, I, th I think I said that he was uh, one of the men who came to say goodbye to her body, but not, not to stay the whole night. Um, Again, you know, for Merceau, this is amazing. And, you know, even he, he, he doesn't care about that uh, in any sense. Anyway, they took her to um, the church. And the, the whole process here of burying her was uh, really is um, uh, amazing. And here he tells us about the weather and the sun and the heat and um again uh, he is saying here notice the sky was so dazzling and he really uh, is is not very happy at all to walk in this terrible weather and he said it gave me a queer dreamlike impression the blue white glare overhead and all the blackness around me the sleek black of the horse the dull black of the men's clothes, the silverly black gashes in the road, and so on. You know, it seems the whole thing to him is ugly, and he's not happy. And, you know, he, he really is explaining everything in a, in a terrible way, as if to say, why, why August? You know, I want to go back. I don't want to spend more time in this. So, again, we say, come on, you're not real. You are not real in, in any fashion. Um, notice, uh, so here, the whole thing went. He said that after that, everything went in a rush. So they buried her, and he was happy. Also, with such precision and matter-of-factness, I remember hardly any details. You know, that's it. Uh, you know, I said, I, I got um, rid of, if you like, of the whole matter. Except that when we were on the outskirts of the village, the nurse said something to me. Her voice shook, took me by surprise. It didn't match her face at all. It was musical and slightly tremulous. What she said was, if you go too slowly, there is the risk of a heart stroke. But if you go too fast, you perspire 
and the gold, the cold air in the church gives you a chill. I saw her point either way, either way was, either way one was in for it. Um, as if to say, um, the ways in which he was uh, taking the whole matter in a very careless fashion and in a very absolutely emotionless, heartless, uh, mindless, you know, uh, and all that, uh, I think, which is really amazing here. Um, some other memories of the funeral has struck in my mind. The old boy's face, for instance, when he caught up with us, they caught, when he caught up with us for the last time, just outside the village, his eyes were streaming with tears of exhaustion, of distress, or both together. But because of the wrinkles, they couldn't d flow down. They spread out, crisscrossed, and formed a smooth gloss on the old, worn face. And I can remember the look of the church, the villagers in the street, the red uh, geraniums on the graves, Perez's fainting, fainting fit. He crumbled up like a rag doll. The 20 red earth um, pattering, sorry, pattering on mother's coffin. The bits of white roots mixed up with it. Then more people, voices, the wait, the wait outside the cafe for the bus, the rumble of the engine, and my little thrill of pleasure when we entered the first brightly lit streets of Algiers. And I pictured myself going straight to bed and sleeping 12 hours at a stretch. Yeah. Look at him. Um, well, you can see really the way he's counting all these uh, bits and pieces and parts and his, what he remembers of the whole process of burying his mother is, is really very shocking, absolutely shocking. And the way he said, and then I went, you know, I just wanted to go back and get rid of all this. Now, really the shocking, more shocking examples is, is really in the next chapters, really in the next chapters. The way he immediately, um, you know, um, totally forgot about, uh, you know, uh, his mother's death. Um, and again, to, to behave in such a way, just one day after your mother's death, I mean, you should show respect. You should show respect, at least, at least, at least um, for a week, for 10 days, to show respect for the loss or for the death of your mother. I mean, not to be, not to go crazy and, you know, um, behave as if nothing really happened. On, wo on waking, I understood why my employer had looked rather cross when I asked for my two days off. It is a Saturday today. I hadn't thought of this at the time. It only struck me when I was getting out of bed. Obviously, he had seen that it would mean um, my getting four days holiday straight off. And one couldn't expect to like that. Still, for one thing, it wasn't my fault if mother was buried yesterday and not today. And then again, I would have had my Saturday and Sunday off in any case. But naturally, this didn't prevent me from seeing my employer's point. And, you know, he... Um, 
tells us just the next day he started behaving as if really um, nothing, absolutely nothing wrong or nothing happened. Getting up was an effort as I had been really exhausted by the previous day's exper experiences. While shaving, I wondered how to spend the morning and decided that a swim would do me good. So I caught the streetcar that goes down to the harbor. Hmm? So the next day, immediately the next day, the next day after your mother's death, you will go to the sea and swim and enjoy yourself and take your girlfriend with you and do funny things and behave as if absolutely nothing happened? I don't know. Really, I don't know. And this is really shocking. And this is really terrible. And in this chapter, really, I'm not going to read it for you. You please read that yourselves. You know, you get the shock of your life with this man, you know, behaving as if absolutely nothing happened. You know, and this was taken against him again, as I said. They asked his girlfriend or his fiancée, saying how he behaved the next day after his mother's funeral. And even his girlfriend was shocked and saying to him, how can you do this or how can you do that? Especially just yesterday you buried your mother, you know? And really, this is, again, one of the funny, really, uh, attitudes. When I say here really funny, I mean ugly, really ugly and amazing and terrible and, you know, abominable, really abominable uh, you, uh, situation about him in every sense. Um, he really um, is saying here, of course, a lot of things about her in this, uh, you know, uh, in this chapter, uh, really, especially in this page here, the way he immediately uh, is narrating, telling us in details how he went with his girlfriend uh, to swim and the way they were laughing and they were discussing and they were, you know, pleasantly joking and, you know, um, and, and, and you say, come on. Come on, are you real? You are a funny man, you know? Um, um, he said here his girlfriend called Marie, um, really, as I say, um, um, I don't know, I, I thought, um, I thought, um, uh, really, uh, to just, um, if you like, um, uh, to um, um, draw your attention about the strangeness, the absolute strangeness, the weird thing, the really unbelievable elements that you find to some extent in this narrative here, how he is behaving as if absolutely nothing happened. Notice here on this page, when I woke up, Mary had gone. She had told me her aunt expected her first thing in the morning. I remembered it was a, sad, a, a Sunday, and that put me off. I've never cared for Sundays. <laughs> so I turned my head and lazily sniffed the smell of brine that Marie's head, ha, ha, head had left on the pillow. I slept until 10. And, you know, um, notice, I slept until 10. After that, I stayed in bed until noon, smoking cigarettes. And, you know, as if to say, um, really, um, in, in, in a funny way, nothing really happened. Again, you, as I say, you know, this is the shocking thing. But again, as I said, this is absurdism. Really, this is absurdism. And he goes on and on and tell us about his behavior and how he went to see his friend. Uh, he went to see his friend there. 
um, uh, if you like, um, he tells us in details. Please uh, try to read the, the first, this chapter and the first chapter and this chapter um, about just to get the idea about his uh, character more really um, in here, uh, if you like. Um, um, Yeah, it, it, um, here the last, uh, I will read here the last bit of the, of the chapter. It struck me that I, uh, I had better, sorry, I would better see about some dinner. I had been leaning so long on the back of my chair, looking down, that my neck hurt when I straightened myself up. I went down, brought some bread and spaghetti did my cooking and ate my meal standing. I uh, had intended to smoke uh, to another cigarette at my window, but the night had turned rather chilly and I decided against it. As I was coming back after shutting the window, I glanced at the mirror and saw reflected in it a corner of my table with my spirit lamp and some bits of bread beside it. It occurred to me that somehow I got, I've, I would, um, I had uh, got through another Sunday, that mother now was buried, that mother now was buried, and tomorrow I'd be going back to work as usual. Really nothing in my life had changed. Yeah? So that's it to him. Nothing in his life had changed. Um, well, this is really the idea he wants to say. Um, that please don't for, don't blame me. You know, I don't feel that there's anything changed. Losing my mother to me is nothing. Really, it doesn't mean anything. And you know, when he's saying this, um, you say, yeah, he's a really. Uh, amazing, funny man in every sense. Now, let me uh, really tell you which chapters to read, because I don't want you to read the whole thing. So please read the first three chapters, page 23, the last, the first three chapters, please read the first three chapters, and um, uh, let me check. Um, Okay, the first three chapters and the last two chapters, really, just that. Okay, so three chapters from the beginning of the novel, the first three chapters, read them carefully, and the last, the last two chapters of the novel. Okay, um, from page, yeah, here, yeah, page 62 till the end, 62 till the end, chapters 4 and 5, okay, chapter 4 and 5 uh, at the end, page 62 till, till, um, till the end, okay. 
because here really the conclusion of the novel really it's um, it's important to see how he reflected about the whole the whole thing. Okay, um, uh, here you have a little note about Albert Camus, as you can see here uh, a little a little a little conclusion or a little funny. It's supposed to be introductions or about the author should be at the beginning, but anyway. Okay, so that's it for today, um, ladies and gentlemen. Next week, I'll give you only one, one the last meeting will be, uh, our uh, last meeting will be Monday. Monday will be our last meeting. I'm not going to give you, uh, in, in week 15, week 15, I will not give any lectures. Next week, week 14, I will give you only one, one more meeting, one more recording, and that's it. Okay, any, um, any question, boys and girls?